My name is Steve. How y'all doing? Thanks for coming. I appreciate you being here. How many uh, were not in my video presentation yesterday? Okay, so a bunch. So I'll, I'll have to do that one slide over. Sorry to the rest of you. Um, I'm Steve. I am from Charlotte, North Carolina. I've got a small marketing firm in Charlotte, North Carolina. We do video, we do photography, but the thing that we've been doing the most, most recently is, is we're pretty heavy on WordPress design development and cybersecurity is uh, really, really becoming the major crux of our business. But I love, love, love video and I love, love, love photography. And I'm honored and excited. I actually didn't get a whole lot of sleep last night because I was, I, was, I was excited about this talk. So uh, hopefully, A, I won't fall asleep in the middle of it, and uh, B, hopefully you'll find it interesting. So uh, quick little ditty about me, if I can get this thing to work. Oh, you got to turn it on. 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 Come on. OK. Looks like we're going to go old school on this. Yep. All right, so uh, I did the corporate thing for 13 years. I started off in finance, and I didn't like it. So I built a database that took care of all the finance stuff for the company and got the attention of the IT department. And I weaseled my way into the IT department, and I never looked back. So that's kind of how I ended up in the IT side of things. Uh, my wife got a really good job in Charlotte back in 2004 or something like that. And uh, I dabbled in real estate for a little while and decided that I wanted to go into marketing full time. So I started my own little, little video. It started vi with video and photography, a uh, little outfit called Amazing Video Tours. And uh, I was the first one in Charlotte doing professional videography and professional photography uh, within the real estate industry. So added website design a couple years later, one of my realtor clients asked me to build a website for and I was absolutely terrified. And then I got in WordPress 2.4.1, I think is right around the time that I got in, for those of you who understand that vernacular. So uh, real estate's kind of my thing. That's, uh, I, I, I do really more of that. I've got more real estate clients than just about anything else, although I don't try to pigeonhole myself into the real estate market. Uh, that just happens to be where the vast majority of my clients are. Uh, this crazy thing that you see, that if you've ever watched NFL games, you see the guy running around, that's the Steadicam. I do a lot of Steadicam stuff. Uh, I was, again, I was one of the very, very first people to do Steadicam and walk through videos, not only in Charlotte, but, but you know, I used to go to video conferences and stuff like that. And, there was a time when there were less than five of us in the whole country that do it, and now there's thousands and thousands of people that do it. So um, I'm going to get into the drone stuff. Uh, also, a very, very early adopter of the drone stuff. I was doing drone stuff before drone was actually even a word. Uh, in the, in, you know, they were flying drones in Australia long before we kind of caught on here in the United States, and uh, I've got a few Australian friends who helped me get up and running with drones before they were even available in stores here. So, and I've had the uh, real nice opportunity. I've worked with commercials, I've worked with uh, music videos, and I've actually been a, a part of uh, casting and crew in a couple of movies. So, when I started Amazing Video Tours, I was 80% video, 20% web. Um, I'm gonna be 50 next year, and carrying those big, heavy cameras for 16 hours a day in the hot sun started to get kind of old. I know I won't be able to carry that into my 50s and 60s, but I know that I can sit and write code and uh, develop uh, websites for as long as I need to. So uh, I've really transitioned my business a lot more towards the uh, uh, website design development and cybersecurity end. And y'all, th those of you who are in my video thing know about my little uh, passion for YouTube. So this some examples. This is why I get paid. This is how I feed my kids. Uh, basically, real estate and architectural photography. I've been doing it for years and years and years. Um, you know, I don't like to talk about me, but I, I have had the fortune of this. I, I have had my images on covers of magazines and stuff like that. So uh, it's, it's been a really good ride. And I love, love, love photography. My first paid gig ever, I was 12. And uh, I had a friend who was uh, aspiring to be in a band. He was probably 14, 15, and uh, actually ended up doing promos for his band. And uh, that, that, there a couple people from the band actually made it, made it pretty big. So uh, it, was, it was exciting to have an opportunity to get a paid gig as a 12-year-old as a photographer. So uh, my, my passion for photography started very, very young. Um, I've done a lot of product photography uh, over the years. Uh, 
obviously a faucet company and a fan company. Um, this was for a carpenter in Charlotte, and uh, he did beautiful work, but he didn't have any clients because nobody, he, he, he would, had no way of showing off his, his work. And he told me that this is, uh, he put this image on his website, and now he's got more work than he knows what to do with, just based on this one image. So that's what I love. I love building marketing tools that help other companies make a lot of money. And, and it's wonderful to get a call from somebody and say, hey, I made a lot of money because of the tool that you made for me. Okay. I've had the fortune, I've been very fortunate to travel and uh, you know, do some stuff for golf courses. And then there's the aerial stuff, which is an incredible passion of mine. Like I said, I've been flying longer than probably the vast majority of anybody who flies drones. And I'll kind of take you down my little bit of path. But uh, that's, a, that's actually a $2.2 .2 million house. And if you notice the photo quality of this house compared to the next picture, the first one was from a helicopter. The, the owner of the house actually paid us to go up in a helicopter and, 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 and shoot the house from a helicopter. That's why. So that other one was taken with a, a professional DSLR. This is taken with a GoPro from one of my drones. Uh, still passing quality, still pretty darn nice picture, but not nearly as nice as, as the last one. Uh, I've done a lot of commercial stuff too. This is a BMX track in a place called Rock Hill, South Carolina. They wanted me to do some stuff for them. And any NASCAR fans? We're in Alabama and there's no NASCAR fans? What about Talladega? All right, all right, well, the, that house right there is uh, Kurt Busch's house. And then the house two doors down is his brother, uh, Kyle Bush. And rumor has it that Dale Earnhardt uh, has a house in the neighborhood too, but they wouldn't tell me where he lived because they know how much of an Earnhardt fan I am. And <laughs> they just knew it would, it would probably not be a good idea. And then uh, this is a, a, another place. It's actually a different lake uh, outside of Charlotte. And that big house right there is, uh, well, the, the biggest one is uh, the CEO of Bank of America, Charlotte. And then the one right next to him supposedly is Tony Stewart of NASCAR fame as well. So uh, that was, here's another shot that was taken from the helicopter. I figured while I was in the air for the one, I might as well take a few more too. So my evolution of flight, and I'm going I'm to make this quick, but I just kind of want to take you down a, a little path. As a photographer and a videographer, even back in 2005, I was dying to put a camera on something that flew. Ever since I got the bug from being in that helicopter that one night, I was like, I've got to figure this out. And then this little company called GoPro came out with the GoPro One. I was like, yes. And this helicopter doesn't exist anymore. This camera doesn't exist anymore. I have no idea where they are. It flew away. <laughs> I never found it. I never found it. So uh, I was depressed. and. Uh, I met some people from Australia online, YouTube and stuff like that, and I started getting into this whole, it's called a quadcopter. It's, it's essentially, it's a helicopter with four propellers. You know, now we call them drones, which I still hate that term, but this is my first drone. This was the beginning of my first drone. I was, like I said, I was building them long, long before. This is back in the day when you had to program them yourself. So, this is the first one I ever built. Took me 13 months to build it. Took me 13 seconds to crash it. <laughs> the Wright brothers flew 11 seconds. I got them beat. All right, so that was number one. I progressed to this one, and then at some point I had a nice stable of drones that were nice and reliable. And that's basically the one with the six rotors is the one where I got the vast majority of those those images from the sky. This is Lake Wiley, South Carolina. This is my friend Jim. Jim has over 2,000 professional dives. This is Jim diving for one of my $4,000 drones at the bottom of South, uh, Lake Wiley. <laughs> Never found the drone. 4,000 bucks. So I, I think back to Mickey's talk about the peaks and valleys of business. Well, that was certainly a valley. Excuse me, a, yeah, the valley. Two days later, I get a call from a guy who's going to be doing a film for Sony Pictures, and they need some aerial stuff. And Sony was going to help buy a drone for me. And I got this monster. And I flew that sucker. I flew it once while being fully insured by Sony Pictures to fly it. I flew it once. I was a nervous wreck. Uh, 
but we did what we did for the movie and we got it, we got it done and ended up actually, Sony basically let me have the drone and I ended up selling it because I was afraid to fly it. But it was awesome when I was flying it. That's about $10,000 up in the air at once. So uh, that's why it, it, it just got, uh, got, got big. Um, I have had good fortune. I've gotten a chance to work with a lot of models over the years as well. So, you know, models are more fun than architecture and a lot less than fun than architecture for the obvious reasons. They're a lot harder to work with. Um, but the professional ones are great to work with. And the little redhead in the middle, that's my daughter. You're going to see her a lot in this, uh, in this presentation. Um, the reason why I'm showing you all these pictures is because my goal for you is by the time that we're done here today, and I've got to make sure I'm staying tracking on time. How am I doing on time? Because I just can't. Have, um, how am I doing on time? All right. Uh, my goal for you is that there's no picture or no image up here, you know, obviously aside from the aerial stuff. Um, I want you to be able to walk out of here with the knowledge of how to take a lot of these shots. So I'm going to share a lot of images with you. And uh, I want to whet your appetite. And I, want, I, want, I want to get you excited about photography. And I'm going to teach you how to do it. Okay, so that's kind of our, our structure. So I have a theme. My theme is capture the moment. And you probably knew this was coming. Can I capture the moment with my cell phone? Or do I need a DSLR? Or even a, even, even a beginning level DSLR to capture a lot of these images? And I'm going to let you decide. Okay? Here's image number one. You go to see the Harlem Globetrotters. You know the inevitable pail of, of confetti is coming. You just don't realize that it's going to happen two, three rows behind you. Would I have captured this image with my cell phone? I might have. But I knew that with my DSLR, I knew I wasn't going to miss the moment. Okay, So I probably would have caught the image here with my cell phone. It probably wouldn't have been nearly as memorable. Okay. So in my opinion right now, it's, it's DS, DLSR, DSLR 1, cell phone 0. OK, no NASCAR fans in the room. I'm sorry. I'm a huge NASCAR fan. These are two of my heroes, Jeff Gordon and Dale Earnhardt Jr. I was 50 yards from these guys with probably just 1,000 people between me and them. And I, had the, I was fortunate enough to get to go down on the track while they were doing driver introductions and capture this shot with my DSLR. Would I have caught this one with my cell phone? No way. They were way, way, way too far away. But I was able to capture this. I'm going to teach you how to do all this stuff is, is the point. Keep that in mind. So DSLR 2, cell phone 0. The big win? That little redhead right there is my baby. They won the regional championship in basketball. I love these girls. It brings. Oh, I just, these girls are just, I love these girls. My daughter's been playing basketball with these girls since she was four years old. They're like, they're all like daughters to me. This was taken from the stands. Would I have captured that moment with my cell phone? Heck no. So DSLR three, cell phone zero. The big yawn. <laughs> That's my boy Tyson right there. I probably might have caught that one with my cell phone, but I don't think it would have come out as good. So I think the DSLR is still winning. I mean, we could throw this one at the, cell, at the cell phone if you want to, but I still think that I wouldn't have been able to capture this image not nearly as well with my cell phone as my DSLR. So here's a shot with my DSLR. And the caption obviously reads, don't just take a snapshot. There is nothing memorable about this picture. That's my girl right there with the ball. And she did make the shot. But who cares? It's such a crappy shot. It's just like, ugh. I see all the moms and the dads, and I don't mean to offend you if you are one of these moms or dads, that, that some of them have iPads at a, at a, at a, at a basketball game. And I'm going to tell you something about basketball, indoor basketball, and dance recitals and stuff like that. Those are the hardest things to photograph because you need the most photography skills to do indoor action type stuff. I'm going to teach you how to do it. I'm going to teach you how to get there. But this is never going to suffice. I would, never be, I would never show this off to somebody. Okay. So don't just take a snapshot. Capture the emotion. This coach, again, coached my daughter all through middle school. I love this man. He was so good to those girls. He taught them so much. 
And this picture captures, you, you can look at him and you can tell where he is in the moment. He was, he was cheering his team on. You know, they were down by four. There was a few minutes left in the game. And he, he's got, you, th that was a very, you got this moment. And I love this picture because I, 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 I have so much admiration for him. And it captures the moment. It's not just a snapshot. Once again, DSLR. I was probably 50 feet from him when I took that shot. <laughs> Alana, she's terrified because she's got to go to the line with one second left to win the game. Absolutely terrified. I was so high up in the stands, there's no way in the world I would have captured this shot without a DSLR. So I don't know what the score is, but I think you get my point. It's, it's worth carrying around a bigger camera to capture these moments because these moments are, they're so fleeting. I mean, the girls were... 13 or 14 here, these girls are all 17, 18 years old now, okay? All right, get off of the emotional thing, although I got, I got a lot more of my kids. I think that's why I like this one so much is because I got my kids in it. I want to teach you how to do some really cool special effects. Uh, if you take a filter from uh, any, any camera and you put it kind of at a bookend, you get kind of a heart. That's kind of a, a cool thing. So this is kind of my intro into creating special effects. Once again, I'm rambling on and on and on here, but I want to whet your appetite because I'm going to teach you how to do all this stuff. Anybody ever seen this before? I don't recommend you do it unless you're in South Carolina at the beach because it is kind of dangerous. But essentially what you do is you put a piece of steel wool in a whisk. You set the camera up from a distance, and I'm going to teach you how to do that and you put the whisk on a string, and you do this, and you turn. And it captures, it's called a, a spark orb or something like that. It has a name, I don't know what the name is, but I'm gonna teach you how to take a shot like this. It's just for fun. I just, I love photography. And these are just some of the fun things that you could do, not necessarily with your cell phone, but with a real decent camera. I call this one fun with flashlights. Boys love this one. Just if you have like a 12 year old, there's another picture. The boys were going like this so that you could see kind of the waves coming out of their mouth. But I won't show you the other picture where they turned around and showed me their hinds <laughs> and demanded that I take the same exact picture that way. Uh, and then the chair, I'm going to teach you how I did the chair shot. Just more fun. And how to be every kid's hero by teaching them how to do all these little tricks. Oh, man. Uh, this one was, it, it just happened to be the uh, Amazon or whoever it was came to the door. The door was just open a little bit and there was, if you can see in the background, just a little crack of light. And I told my daughter to just sit in the crack of light and she jumped in there and ended up being one of my favorite pictures that I've ever taken. Just kind of happenstance. Once again, DSLR. DSLRs allow you to take images with a shallow depth of field. And what a shallow depth of field means is you're primary subject is, is nice and in focus, and you get that blurry, hazy background, okay? Because when we, t when we take images, we're telling a story. And when you take a snapshot and everything in the entire photo is in focus, you, it's, a, it's hard to call attention to what the primary image is. So I'm gonna talk about depth of field. If you look very carefully at the piano picture, the foreground's blurry, the middle ground is in sharp focus, and the background is blurry, that's even, a uh, a more reduced depth of field. I'm gonna teach you how to do this, okay? Whoops, back it up, back it up. This is playing with shutter speed. What I did here was I essentially set the camera to have the shutter open for a long period of time while cars went whizzing by to capture their taillights. I'm gonna teach you how to do this. And there's my girl again. This is called panning. Basically what I did was I set the camera. She's on one of those carnival rides that just goes around and around in a circle. So what I did was I followed her with the camera and followed her and followed her and then clicked the camera as I continued to follow her. She's in ultra sharp focus, but nothing else in the image is focused, giving us, you know, obviously motion. And she's what I want you to look at. The rest of it is just, you know, icing on the cake. I'm gonna teach you how to do that. And then I'm going to get in a little bit of Photoshop fun. This might be kind of stretching it a little bit, but there's a concept called multiplicity. This is my daughter and her best friend. And my daughter and her best friend 
and my daughter and her best friend, and my daughter and her best friend, and in the picture is my daughter and her best friend. It's called multiplicity. Just more fun Photoshop tricks, and, and when I'm in the happiness lounge, some of these Photoshop things I can, I can teach you about there, but they're kind of beyond the scope of what I'm trying to talk about here. Uh, another one, the kids love karate. My daughter went all the way, got a black belt. My son, well, he's another story. I love him to death, but he's not exactly the finisher like my daughter is. Uh, but they got their, their red belt. It goes red, brown, black. So my daughter got her red, and my, my son got his orange on the same day. And because belts are so important in karate, I used Photoshop to basically bring out the color of the belts, but make everything else black and white. And this is another one of my favorite images that I've ever taken. So. And uh, I was going to try to do a Jimmy Stewart impersonation, but I'm just going to spare you of that. But you know, you know, you want the moon, Mary? Well, why don't I throw a lasso around it and bring it into you? That's what this is, more Photoshop fun. Okay, the moon is not that big. Here is, if you look closely in the lens, my son is taking a picture of me, and that's the picture of me. And I'm taking a picture of my son, which I Photoshopped him in the image inside the camera. Just more fun, more Photoshop fun. Okay, you tired, you tired yet? Oh, and then my puppy. It's called a pop-up picture, another Photoshop trick. Fun with cameras, okay? Lots and lots and lots of fun. And then of course, a lot of people don't realize this, but time-lapse is not video sped up. It's actually images taken every increment, say five seconds, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, what have you, um, and then all meshed together is what makes for a good time-lapse. A lot of people don't realize that. Okay. You tired of the, the, the demo? Now you want, you want to learn some stuff? All right, let's get on a, let's get on to learning some stuff. I'm going to hit you with some very, very bare bone basics. You're going to be like, duh, but I'll make your head spin a little bit later. We got to start with the basics. I see this all the time. It drives me absolutely bonkers. And my wife has to basically step on my foot to shut me up because I, I, I want so badly to just go and tell the person how to take a real picture. This is an example of a bad background. Good intentions, bad background. What I did with my son, he's standing in the driveway, the cars are there, it's an ugly image. I basically just turned him 40 or 90 degrees to where we would have a better background. And my, my, my thought for you here is keep it, you know, be cognizant of what's behind whatever you're trying to take a picture of because in about three seconds, we were able to get much better background than the cars and all the other nonsense, okay? Just, just by repivoting him, okay? So pay attention to your background. It'll make for a better image. Where is the sun? I think this came up yesterday. Somebody asked me about the sun. Well, when the sun is beating down on your subject, it's going to cause these crazy uh, shadows and not, look, not make for a very, you know, nice photo. I turned the boy like this, where the sun was at his side, and it made for a much, much nicer image. So kind of be cognizant of where the sun is in the sky, because the sun is your light source, and as you're going to find out by the time we get done with all this nonsense, light is your best friend when it comes to good photography. Okay? All I did was turn him. That was it. So this is an example of, hey, can you take a picture of us? And the person took a picture of us. Um, and I hate that picture. Just, you can't see us. That's one, a near and dear friend of mine who uh, actually works for one of the NASCAR teams and, and, and got me down real close to where I could take a lot of these NAS cool NASCAR pictures. But after he took the picture, I handed the camera to somebody else and I said, hey, can you take a picture of us? And although the background isn't all that great, we were kind of limited within the confines of where we were, at least I got a, good, a decent picture of, of me and my buddy. And both of these were taken with um, cell phones, by the way. Okay? But my point here is, where's the sun? If the sun is behind your subject and you're shooting into the sun, you're never going to have a good picture. The sun is to the side of the subject or behind you as you're taking an image, you're going to have a much better picture. All right, audience participation time. What is wrong with this picture? Okay, yeah, we got some shadows. But there's a bigger problem that, I, that I, I want to convey to you. We cut his feet off. So from a photography standpoint, you never want to cut off the appendages, okay? 
if you're taking a, a, a picture of an individual, you can, you can cut them above the knee, okay? But don't cut them below the knee and, and don't cut their appendages off because it just makes for a, a not very good picture. But you're right, the sun wasn't the greatest here either, but that's not what I was trying to convey. I see this all the time, my kids growing up. People stand directly over their kids and they take the picture. My kid looks like a little mouse. <laughs> Look like a scrawny little mouse. Yeah, right back at you, sister. He doesn't look so scrawny right here. When you take pictures of children, if you get down low and you take pictures up, it's, it's just going to make that much, much better of a picture. I'll tell you right now, my boy loves the picture on the right. He hates the picture on the left. And he's the one who used the term mouse. He says, I look like a mouse. So keep that in mind when you're taking pictures of children. Don't stand over them and shoot them. So another quick example of that, I'm standing up. I'm six foot one. The boy was jumping off of the thing. I love making my kids jump off of stuff. It drives my mother-in-law and my wife crazy, but my kids have tons and tons of pictures of them in flight. That's me standing up, but when I sat down on the ground, it makes him look like, yeah, he's a superhero. And if you know anything about it, I guess he was probably around nine or 10 here. Nine or 10 year old boys love to look like superheroes. How are we doing so far? Good? All right, so what's wrong with this one? Yeah, you ever seen somebody take a picture like this? That's what you're going to end up with. Don't take a picture like this. Bring it straight. And you'll have a straight looking kid. Okay? Like I said, some of these are pretty dull, but yet at the same time, I see people do these things every single day. Okay, this one's pretty obvious. Yeah. Focus is the issue here. Okay, what's wrong? Cut his appendages off. I, I learned this in 1984. There's a picture of, of now I'm going to date myself here, the U.S., uh, the women's gymnastics team and the men's gymnastics team did awesome at the L.A. Olympics. There was a picture of Mitch Gaylord on the rings, and they cut his hands off, so you couldn't tell. It was, it was on the front page of the L.A. Times. You couldn't see what he was doing. It was the dumbest thing in the world that I've always thought. Don't cut the appendages off of people because you, you have no context of, of what they're doing. So here he was accomplishing this great feat, you know, holding himself up in the rings. You, you couldn't even tell. It was pathetic. And it made the front page. And if you're wondering about the transitions, I, I, I teach kids. Um, so, and they love all the crazy transitions. I know that it's not so great for adults, but it is what it is. So there's the boy again. He's standing right smack dab in the middle of the image. So I'm going to ask you, does that look nicer? Or does it look nicer with him a little bit offset, where you can see the background a little bit? Okay. There is a rule of composition. It is rule number one in any photography composition book called the rule of thirds. You do just this one thing. You change this one thing in your photography. People aren't going to know why your pictures are better. They're just going to feel like they're better. This is called the rule of thirds, and it's a tic-tac-toe board. So cut your image into a tic-tac-toe board and put your primary image somewhere where it's intersect intersecting with two lines, and you'll have a much nicer image. Okay? That's called the rule of thirds. I think this one's pretty obvious. We've all seen overexposed and underexposed pictures. We're going to talk about settings so that you don't make this mistake, and you end up with a much better image. Okay, put your seatbelts on. This is where it gets hard. <laughs> Have I talked you guys into at least being interested in, in, in trying to use a better camera than your, than your cell phones? Okay, so let's take it one step further. I don't care what camera you get. I don't care whether it's an Icon or a, a Canon or a Sony or a Panasonic or whatever. DSLRs now are cheap. You don't need one like I use every single day because you, you don't do, I, you're not out in 120 degrees sweating all over it and all that kind of stuff on some days and some days I'm out in 14 degree weather, you know, and the, and the, and the things icing up. You don't need anything like that. That's a professional camera is built for the rigors of, of that type of abuse, but you can still get a nice DSLR nowadays for $399. And if you really want to be uh, uh, cost conscious, buy one on eBay for half that. People buy cameras, they don't use them, and they sell them. They're like boats and used cars. You can get a really nice camera on eBay 
uh, barely used for a really, really cheap price. Probably surprise you. So let's get out of easy mode. And as you know, one of these dials is a Canon, the other one's a Nikon. I actually own both and I forgot which one's which. I think the Nikon is on the right. You've got auto, which is the green mode. P, which is program mode, okay, which is basically green mode that you can override. We're gonna skip that. A is aperture priority. You set the aperture, the camera does everything else. S is for shutter speed, you set the shutter speed, the camera does everything else. And then M is manual, you set everything. And we're gonna tackle each of them individually. We're gonna start with aperture priority mode because this is the funnest place to start, okay? I highly recommend you start an aperture priority mode on your journey to take better images. Because you're gonna pick the aperture and the camera's gonna do the rest of the work for you. So we're gonna take baby steps here. Now, aperture is one of the most crazy, hard to understand concepts in all of photography, and I think this is what turns most people off. So I'm gonna give you the example that helped me get it, finally get it after, I don't know, three or four years of taking pictures. I don't think I understood aperture. I started at age 12, I don't think I got this until I was around 16 or 17. When you're asleep at night, you wake up in the middle of the night, and you open your eyes, you can pretty much see what's going on in the room, right? Because your pupil is huge, right? You stumble to the bathroom, you flip on that light, and you're like, wow, right? Because your pupil is huge. You have to wait for your pupil to undilate to be able to digest that light. Aperture in your camera works the exact same way. Aperture means the camera's pupil is either huge, why? To let tons of light in, or really, really, really small, because you're at a baseball game in the middle of the day and you don't necessarily need to let all that light in, okay? So when your camera goes, opens and shuts, when the shutter opens and shuts, it does two things. It, well, it does one thing, it lets light in. But the amount of light that it lets in is determined by two factors. How much, how big is the pupil? And how long is that shutter open and shut? We're gonna talk about the pupil first, but just know that that's the two things, that, that's the only two things that happen when that shutter opens and closes. That shutter can open and shut as fast as one eight thousandth of a second, which I can't clap that fast, uh, and it can stay open as long as you want it to. It can stay open for 30 minutes if you wanted it to, okay? We'll get to shutter priority in a second. Let's, let's digest aperture priority. Big pupil, lots of light. Little pupil, less light. And here is the most confusing thing about cameras is for whatever reason, and I don't know the reason, the numbers are backwards. It doesn't make any sense, and this throws so many people off. When it's open huge, it's a little number, and when it's open just a teeny bit, it's a really, really big number, and I don't know why that is. I don't care. Just if you, Once you get your head around the fact that 1.8 is really, really big, and 22 is really, really, really small, you'll be able to start understanding the f-stop or the aperture on your camera settings, okay? The other thing is I have halves and doubles. F1.8, it doesn't look like it, but F1.8 lets in twice as much light as F2.8, which lets in twice as much light as a four, twice, 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 okay? Conversely, if you go the other way, it doubles each time, okay? So apertures are halves and doubles, and that's, I guess, where those numbers come from. But if you can wrap around your head around the fact that the small number is, is the big aperture, um, you'll be well on your way to understanding aperture priority and being able to use A mode on your, on your DSLR. Everybody get that? Did I explain it right? Okay. Low light. What kind of aperture do you think I used on this one? First of all, I was not supposed to have a DSLR to rock concert. Right? Oh, I didn't, whoop. Okay, that was a 2.8 lens, okay? It was a 2.8 lens. Here's another cool thing. Remember earlier I was talking about that soft background? Okay, aperture mode determines depth of field. That's how much of the image is going to be in focus. And I have a little trick for you to remember this. 
big aperture, big aperture, small number. I know it doesn't make sense, but a big aperture of 2.8, this is the way I remembered it when I was a kid. Whatever I'm focusing on, about 2.8 feet in front of them and 2.8 feet behind them is going to be in focus. Okay? Whereas if I'm at f22, or this, in this example, f16, you see how all the hats are in focus at f16? So the focus is on the, the hat in the front, but you can still see that all the other ones are in focus. So if you want a real shallow depth of field, 2.8 is kind of an easy number to remember because if you just think about your subject, probably 2.8 feet in front of them, 2.8 feet behind them is going to be in focus. Okay? And you get that nice portrait feel with the milky background and everything like that. You were showing me pictures on your phone about with the flower and you didn't know how you were getting that. That's all aperture priority. She was showing me pictures of flowers on her phone and they were beautiful portraits where the flowers were, were in sharp, in sharp uh, uh, focus, but the stuff in the background was, was all blurred. And I told her, I promised her that today I was going to teach her how that was done. So that's aperture, OK? OK, pop quiz. The Grand Canyon. Is this F22 or is this F2? Yes, you're listening. Yes, absolutely. I can't think of anything larger than the Grand Canyon. Take a picture of five minutes. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So five minutes and then 15 after that. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Okay. There she is again. Sorry. F22 or F2? Okay. Everybody understand after priority? Now here's the cool thing. You go home, you put your camera in aperture priority, and the camera's going to still make the decision about the shutter speed for you. So you can play in aperture priority and not worry about the shutter speed yet, which is really, really cool. Like I said, baby steps. I'm teaching you what took me years and years and years and years to figure out. And, and you probably remember those film days. I would take like a roll of 12 and get them back a week later and not remember what. I was never disciplined enough to write down. I knew I should, my father was like, you should write them down, write them down. I never did. It took me years to figure it out. I, I really didn't figure things out until digital came out. <laughs> but shutter priority mode. Now we're talking about how long is that shutter open, OK? OK. When you take cityscapes, I recommend you do a few things. Do it in winter when the air is cold and dense and crystal clear. It was so cold this night. It was, it was probably 18 degrees. Uh, the other thing I did was take a buddy. Last thing you want to do is be out there with your head in a $5,000 piece of gear and no cover. You know? And uh, this picture was taken in a, in a, in a part, part of Charlotte where if I had been alone, yeah, I might have gone home without the camera that night. Okay? So for night photography, I'm a big advocate of bring a buddy. Uh, so this picture was actually six months in the making, me and my buddy, in terms of you know, getting permission from our wives to be able to go out on a Tuesday night in February and, you know, and, and do this. It, it, it was a long time coming together, but it's, it's one of my favorite pictures that I've ever taken. Shutter priority mode. We wanted the shutter open for a long period of time because as the cars drove by, that's what created the streaks of light. Now, the camera's sitting still on a tripod, not moving at all, and that's why the city, uh, city in the background is still sharply in focus. Okay. I don't remember what the settings were on this one, but I think it's on the next slide. All right, so yeah, a minute. Now, to my non-NASCAR fans in the room, when the cars are on um, pit road, they're still going 55, 60 miles per hour, so they're still moving pretty good. So this picture of Dell Jr.'s car, he was doing about 55 at the time. I need a really fast shutter speed, like 1 350th of a second to be able to capture that and still make it nice and clear. You guys get the difference? OK? All right, quiz. Is this a fast or a slow shutter speed? Fast. fast. Anybody want to guess? Say again? One, two, good, good guess. Ten, ten, one, one, four, one, four so that's how, that's how much shutter speed you need to be able to capture a bullet going through a pumpkin. I didn't take that, by the way. So. Fast or slow? Slow. 
if you look closely, you can see kind of a ghostly image of me. What I did was I took a little pen light flashlight and I stood by the chair. I made sure that I continued to move so that I wouldn't be in the picture and I just kind of lighted around the chair is all I did. I showed my son this picture. He and his buddies were doing it for weeks after that. <laughs> I couldn't get my cameras back. Okay, so fun with kids, I tell you what. So yeah, 30 full seconds on that one. You guys have all seen the water pictures, right? One one thousandth of a fountain is boring. Now, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of one one thousandth at all. But you've probably seen the waterfall, uh, waterfall pictures where the water looks nice and creamy. Okay? That's a longer shutter speed. That's one fifteenth of a second. Okay? And speaking of waterfalls, here's the exact. Look at one eight hundredth of a second. That's not going in any magazine anywhere. All right? But you slow it down to a third of a second or even one full second, you get that nice creamy thing. Now remember, these are all taken on tripods. You can't hand hold this or you're going to have a mess. Okay? But set that shutter speed to one second and your crappy snapshot turns into something that, that might end up in a magazine someday. Okay? Shutter speed. Cool thing about shutter speed, you put your camera in S mode to play with shutter speed and it'll set the aperture for you. So you can practice S mode, it'll take care of the A mode, and vice versa for you, okay? And we talked about this one. I promised you I was going to tell you how to do this, okay? You follow the subject, and I didn't get this right on the very first one. I played with it. I played with different shutter speeds and stuff like that, and I decided 160th was uh, the way to go. And that, that's what turned out the best picture, okay? We learning? Who's asleep? Nobody's asleep. Yes, nobody's asleep. All right. Manual mode. This is where you make all the decisions. And I'm going to tell you right now, indoor sports is, is, is a big deal. Here's the situation. Alana's going up for the layup. I needed her in crisp focus, but yet I also wanted to stop her motion, right? If you look at number three, number three is out of focus. She's, a, she's in front of Alana, and everything else behind her is out of focus. I want you looking at number 12. And it's obvious I want you looking at number 12, okay? That's the difference between a, a really nice shot and, and, and a snapshot. Because with a snapshot, everything's going to be super in focus. It's probably going to be a little bit blurry. You're not going to know what to look at, okay? So you guys get how I did this? Aperture priority. Actually, I take that back. Man, manual mode, I probably had her at probably F4 and a very, very fast shutter speed to, to, to stop the motion, okay? All right, let's play, how is this shot? Somebody yell at a uh, f-stop. Anybody? 2.8? How about a shutter speed? In order to freeze motion, you need a shutter speed of 250, 2, 250th or faster. So if you're doing your kids' sports and stuff like that, and, and you want to freeze motion, 2, 250, 250th of a second or faster. So this one, very shallow depth of field, and a very fast shutter speed. Does that make sense? Am I getting through to y'all? Because I know this is, this is not easy. And this is why most people are not photographers, because this isn't easy. But I try to describe it in a way that, that it does make it easy. It, am I, am I, is it working? Yeah. OK. This is a little harder, because it's more of a middle of the road thing, so I'll just kind of give you the answers. Middle depth of field and moderate shutter speed, OK? I like to take pictures of houses at night and let that shutter just sit open because you get that, when you bathe the house in light and then you just let all that light come out. If, if, if I had used a much faster shutter speed, it would have looked like just kind of a regular boring picture. Okay? Guesses? With a buddy. <laughs> With a buddy. Same buddy, same night. Good call. Who said that? Very good. I like that. Yes, definitely with the buddy. This, uh, Dave, this is at uh, CPCC's parking lot. Uh, yeah, this picture was a pain to take because there was no traffic that night. I mean, just zero. So I was out there sitting there waiting. It's obviously F-22, but that thing was open for five minutes. So to capture that little traffic. And uh, normally Charles got a lot more traffic than that. But uh, yeah, I had to be patient for that one. Okay. Sometimes you got to wait out the shot. 
All right, white balance. I was talking white balance. Where is he? He's not in here. Okay. White balance is this weird color cast that you get on some of your images and you don't know why. And the reason for that is because the white balance isn't set on your camera correctly. Okay. Cameras see in, in, in a color cast called Kelvin, and that's the color temperature. And that's why these little icons, they actually, they actually are important. Um, the gentleman who was taking pictures of the vent earlier today had his white balance on auto, and he was taking pictures out there where it's nothing but fluorescent lights, and his pictures were coming out, guess how? Yeah, exactly. Because it wasn't set right. The auto mode works great for ISO most of the time, but this is a very, very, very fluorescent environment. And when I switched him over to fluorescent, his, his, uh, the color accuracy on his pictures uh, were beautiful. Okay? So, you can get away with IS, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 white balance being in, in, um, in auto mode most of the time. But if you're seeing weird casts, either yellow or purple, try making that switch. Okay? You, don't, you don't have to think about all this stuff all the time. We're starting to get really, really into the weeds in terms of, of advanced features. And the, the, the most in the weeds, furthest, furthest one down is this concept of ISO, which if you guys remember from the film days, film used to come in like 100, 200, 400. That's just basically light sensitivity, okay? And all I'm gonna tell you about ISO is you can cheat. If you're out in the bright sun, take your ISO down. You can use auto mode and it, it'll get it right most of the time. Um, but if it's not getting it right, or if you're trying to take a picture of your kid dance recital or something like that, and even with the, you, you've got it stopped down to the biggest aperture you can get, and you're trying to work with the fastest shutter speed that you can work with, if it's still not working for you, you can cheat it and jack the ISO up because that will add artificial light to your image. The problem is it'll add fuzz to your image too, okay? So depending on how much fuzz you're willing to, to deal with in your image, if you're just sending it you know, to, uh, on the internet or something like that, you could probably get it all the way up to about 3,200 without too, too much fuzz. But if it's something that you want to blow up uh, to one of those uh, things that you put on the wall, you probably want to keep it lower than 800, okay? Okay, and how much, uh, does that mean I'm done? 15 minutes before the next, well guess what, that's the last, uh, okay, lenses. You guys probably all know what 80 to 200 means, right? That's 18 millimeters is, is like real wide, okay? Like if you can see at the 300 millimeters, you see the little red barn. That little red barn is actually in the 18 millimeter, okay? So this is where we're going from, telepho or from telephoto to wide angle. And you can buy lenses that are 18 to 300 that will do all your one-stop shopping. Now the lens is going to be this big, but you only have to buy one lens. But there's, there is a downside to this, okay? So that's called focal length. Everybody get focal length? When people buy lenses, they're pretty in tune with what focal length means. But what in the heck is going on here? We got a Nikon AF-SDX, Nikkor 80 to 200, yada, 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 blah, 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 for 596 and something that looks extremely similar for $2,300 because of the amount of light that it lets in, okay? When you use this lens and you stop it down, you want, you're, you're doing basketball, right? So you want as much light as possible. You stop that sucker down to 3.5 and then you take, you twist the barrel to make it go to 200 because you want to get real tight in on, on the kid or whatever you're gonna notice that your 3.5 just became 5.6. Do you remember the slide about doubles and halves? Okay, if you're at 200 millimeters on this lens, trying to take a picture of your kid going for the layup at 200 millimeters, you're at 5.6 on aperture, right? Which means you're not letting as much light in. You need a blurry picture. That sucker over there is a constant 2.8 all the way through. Doesn't matter where you're at. You could be at 200 millimeters, it's at 2.8. Remember halves and doubles? So I'll get the math wrong here, but 2.8, if you go from 5.6 to 4 to 3.5 to 2.8, and that 
halves each time. What is that, 1 16th as much light? I don't know what the math is. Somebody in here probably knows. It's, it's half, 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 four halves. So we'll, I don't know what that ends up being. But it's a heck of a lot less light. And that's why that lens is a heck of a lot more expensive. Make sense? And super heavy. Good call on that one, yeah. All right? The need for speed. And we just kind of talked about that. I'm going to give you an example. If, if you saw the pictures of me at the, at, the, at the track, I actually had those two lenses. This is the best I could do with the $500 lens. Now, these cars, my, my NASCAR friends, these cars are now on the front stretch. They're doing 180 miles per hour. This is from the same position with the other lens. Crystal clear. They don't even look like they're moving. OK? So that's $2,300 gets you, and that's what the $600 lens gets you. Okay? And, I, and I'm sorry about that. My, my recommendation is just to have your kids do outside sports. <laughs> because if they get into basketball and dance, oh man, you're going to be in deep for lenses if you want to take some good pictures, right? All right, so we're almost done, I think. So freezing the action in near darkness. Um, that kid's mom offered me $500 for this image. I gave it to her. Because I'm not in the business of, I was going to use the R word. Uh, 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 I, I just, I gave it to her. And she was forever, and she's got it blown up. Uh, she's so proud of that picture of, of her boy. Um, because nobody else was capturing images that night. I was probably like 30 rows back. I had my 80 to 200 on, full on 200, OK? It was on 2.8, and I think I was at probably around 250th of a second. And I was the only one in the audience that caught a decent picture of her son that night. And she was forever grateful. Okay? She's also the owner of the studio. So, uh, so it, it, was, it was really cool to be able to do that for somebody else. And crop factor. You guys, if you've ever gone camera shopping, one thing that really, really confuses people is this whole concept of crop factor. Cheaper cameras. And I don't mean to say cheap, I just mean the less expensive cameras are going to have something called a, a crop factor. They're going to crop out some of what a old school 35 millimeter camera used to, uh, uh, 35 millimeter film is, is very wide. It, 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 it captures quite a lot, okay? But the, uh, the sensors, excuse me, on some of the on, the, on the cheaper cameras, they just don't capture as much. To me, just use your zoom. It's not that big of a deal. I, 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 would not, I would not encourage you guys to go out and buy full frame cameras because full frame cameras are super, super expensive. That's 1200 and up. I want to encourage you guys to go out and buy entry level DSLRs, throw it in A mode, and start taking pictures of your kids or grandkids or whatever. Because I got to tell you, it is so rewarding. Um, I've told some of you this between my mom and my stepdad, I'm the youngest of seven. There are no pictures of me as a kid, because I'm just that. Tons of pictures of my older sisters and brothers, but squat. And I made, I made a commitment to myself many, many, many years ago that my kids were going to have pictures of bounds. And we've got a yearbook that's probably this thick every single year, great pictures of my kids. And I love it. And it's a great, great, great thing. So obviously, all of this applies to your work. It applies to your blogs. It applies to helping your clients. But where I was coming from on this whole thing is it's also an awesome, awesome, awesome hobby uh, for great, great, great memories from you, your family, your friends, your kids, and you'll become very popular. Um, one more rule of thumb. Don't be afraid to take crappy pictures. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. For every 100 photos I take, I show other people 10% of them, and they think I'm awesome. <laughs> they don't see the 90 that are crappy, OK? Yeah, forget that. Pa. You don't have to share your crappy pictures with people. Anytime I take, I take pictures of the team and all the girls are at my house, let me see the pictures. Let me, no, 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 I got I to I Photoshop them. Now I'm just picking out the ones that I like the most. Okay, So don't be afraid to take a gazillion pictures and not show the bad ones to people. That's it. Questions? Yes, sir. I like those little booths. The question was product photos. You know, little white booths that you could buy on eBay or, or Amazon, dirt cheap. Uh, and the other thing is a ring light. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, if you ever watch CSI when they take the pictures of you know, the close-ups, they use that ring light that goes around the barrel. That 
gives a lot of really, really nice light to products. Okay? okay? Yes, ma'am. Any entry level DSLR can do that. You put it on, uh, there's, a, there's, there's also a B mode called bulb, where you can actually sit there and hold that shutter open, hold it open, hold it open for as long as you want to. And I'll give you one more little, because you brought that picture up. One of the other things that I did when I took that picture, when there were no cars or nothing really interesting was happening, uh, I put a baseball cap over the barrel of, of the thing so that it was capturing no data at that time. And if you want really, really, really cool fireworks shots, do the same thing. In between the firework, just, just set that sucker to bulb or whatever and just hold that shutter open. And anytime you know, th there's a pause in the fireworks, put a little, put a baseball cap in front of the thing. As soon as you hear that pop of the, of the thing going off, pull the baseball cap away. And, and when the image, when you go to look at the image, it's going to have you know, three minutes worth of fireworks. And people are going to be like, whoa, that must have been the coolest fireworks show ever. No, no, it's just three minutes worth of fireworks. So <laughs> who else? Yes, ma'am. It, I, I probably said it wrong because I'm dyslexic, but it's a DSLR. It's, it stands for Digital Single Lens Reflex. Okay, so you throw it in the A mode? Throw it in A mode and just have a ball. Who else? Yes, ma'am. So if you end up with an image that for some reason is kind of a poor quality, but it's all you have to sort of measure a certain subject, do you have any recommendations for salvaging it for the web? Yeah, I do. It's not exactly the cheapest, but I am a huge fan of Lightroom. It's an Adobe product. Um, Lightroom is a godsend. Um, if you shoot, and, and I'll go over some of your heads here, for, if you shoot raw, you know I'm talking about shooting raw, uh, and you use Lightroom, you can fix just about anything. Okay? Raw is, okay, so w with these DSLRs, you have an option of shooting either JPEGs, which we all know JPEGs, or shooting something called raw. Raw basically, it, it's a much, it's a huge file size for every single image that you take, but it's an uncompressed image. So when you pop it in a Photoshop or you pop it in the Lightroom, you have so much data that you can work with. You can fix messed up white balance. Um, you can fix a lot of bad, bad issues in an image. Yes, sir. I do for sports. Right. Um, your camera will have, you know, Canons are awesome. I mean, well, Nikon's are awesome too, um, but Canons uh, will have a, a, a setting on that dial, or there are settings somewhere. You could either do um, single shot um, sing, or, or multi slow and multi fast. Um, so I, I don't use it a lot, um, but yeah, I mean, you just sit there and put your hammer on it, and, and it, it, the can, Canons will go 11 frames per second. They'll just go. <laughs> You know, Nikons aren't as fast as Canons. So, does that, does that answer your question? Okay. He was, his question was about burst mode. You, you hear, uh, you go to a, a, a professional sports event, especially like a, somewhere quiet like a basketball game, and you hear all the cameras go, you know, that's, that's the guy's, you know, it's that whole one in 10 rule. He's, he's gonna take a picture of the person doing the layup and he's gonna pick the best one if, you know, that, that, he, that he wants and he's not gonna show his friends the rest. Who else? Thank you all very much. I know you have a choice of where to be, and I appreciate that you all decided to hang out with me.